Hi, I'm David Dauber, an Austin advocate for people with disabilities. I welcome you to this, this discussion about getting people involved with disabilities into different faith-based organizations in the Austin area. Today I'm joined by my dear friend, the Reverend Pastor Tina Carter. Hi, David. <laughs> Hi there. Thanks for coming in. Yeah. Chatting with me today. We've known each other for a while now. A few years, yeah. yes. And we met first at church. Yes, we did. You were the pastor at the Rock United Methodist Church when uh, my partner Terry and I came in looking for a new church home. Mm -hmm. And I remember the day as if it was only yesterday. You were very welcoming to us um, and took the time out to, to chat with us, even uh, getting down on one knee so that you were sure to be able to look us eye to eye and welcome us to, to that church community. Yeah, it's one of the interesting things when we have church um, or any kind of faith celebration. A lot of people don't understand that being able to look somebody in the eye is really incredibly important. And if you happen to roll instead of walk, people who walk usually aren't very aware of that. Um, how often do you run into that kind of thing in faith communities? All the time. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. And it's such a simple thing, just looking somebody in the eye that mm -hmm. it's overlooked a lot. I can remember when I first got this uh, super wheelchair that was able to raise and lower me. Yeah. Um, the, the first time I went through the grocery store, um, standing up in the wheelchair, I, I just felt so much, uh, so much pride to be able to look people in the eyes instead of having them actually look down at me yeah. as I went through the aisles of the grocery store. And it made a big difference. It's, it's, they say that it's the small things that make a difference. Well, in, in the grocery store, we get so absorbed in what we're doing Right? that we, don't, it, we aren't as aware of what's going on. Unfortunately, that, ha that happens in faith communities too. We're, we're supposed to be aware of people who are around us if we're involved with a faith-based community. We're supposed to be thinking about people who are older and maybe can't see as well or maybe not hear as well or people who roll instead of walk, but we don't always do a good job of it. Sometimes there's physical things that keep people out and sometimes it's just attitudes that keep people out. And I think about the very first time that you and Terry were um, interviewing to adopt your son. Right. And you were working with a faith-based organization, and I think I got a little angry that day. Do you want to tell the story? <laughs> you did, you did. We were going through um, several different forms mm -hmm. and paperwork just to get the process started. Right. And when they came along on the form of of uh, what is your job mm -hmm. and where do you work? She just nonchalantly set this aside and said, we won't be needing this form, will we? And I, <laughs> I didn't understand. So when she got all done, I looked at her and I said, is that form like, do you not use that form anymore? Has it become obsolete? Why do you not need the employment form? And she looked at me, you guys were both in the room. I was <laughs> just, just there to pray. She looked at me and she said, well, they don't work. And I think I said something like, you know, how can they afford your $20,000 fee <laughs> if they weren't employed? What is wrong with you? Right. You right. guys handled it much better than I did that day. I think that's because you've encountered that kind of attitudinal barrier a lot. Um, I remember when you first came to the church, Terry had talked about an experience she had had at another faith community where they were planning a women's retreat and she really wanted to go but none of the area for the retreat was accessible. Right, they were, they were going on a, a shopping trip um, to an old antique area. I can't even remember which one it was, but somebody from the, uh, f from the study group actually called her and said, you know, we're planning on going on this woman's retreat and we really want you to go, but we want you to be warned at the same time that I've been there before and 90% of the shops aren't accessible, so we're really not sure if you're going to get the full benefit of, of our experience out there. And, you know, it was just, it was heart-wrenching to think that somebody that you had, had grown so close to and as part of a family that they would um, not want to include you in something that they're doing. Well, and you, you never know whether to celebrate that at least they have a tiny clue that there's something wrong with the picture. Like they. <laughs> That, that was good, or, or to just kind of go, oh, are we really still there? 
That happened recently in the faith community where I serve. We um, have a choir that's made up of all different kinds of people, uh, some role and some walk. Um, we have a couple members who have either mental health issues or some um, learning disabilities. We've got older folks who have hearing impairment. We have neurotypicals, we call them. Um, and so it's really different kinds of people. And we're running out of space in our faith community for worship. And people are just coming and coming. And so we're trying to figure out what to do about that. And a group in the church came to me and they had a brilliant idea and they said, we know how to get more room. Uh, we'll just have the choir sit up in the choir loft. Now, just from the name loft, you can imagine that there's probably going to be a problem here. Right. Right. You have to go up four steps to get to the choir loft. And nobody who rolls is going to be able to go there because there's no ramp. And, and so um, when I pointed that out, uh, they said, well, well, the persons that can't make it up the steps, well, they could just sit down at the bottom. But that's not how we do things. <laughs> so how we do things is, in faith communities, how we do things is we think about how to get the maximum number of people included, and that's how we participate. Um, we think about those barriers, and sometimes it's hard. Uh, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's expensive. Do you remember when we were building the church? Um, it was a new church, and we, were, we knew we needed to have a shower. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a couple of folks that rolled in the congregation, one young man whose family had just moved from one house to another, and he, the new house they weren't in yet, and he didn't have anywhere to shower. And we knew that our people were going to use that shower, all of our people. So we knew it had to be accessible. And we wanted it welcoming for other people. I believe it was around the time Hurricane Katrina had happened. That's and right. we had so many people um, coming to Austin, Texas for, for refuge um, because their, their town was underwater. Right. And they needed places to stay. And I remember we were building the church thinking, oh, wouldn't it be so great if if we had walls <laughs> right. right now because we could welcome people in. And that made us think, well, we need to be able to welcome everybody in. Um, if they came, where, where would they um, take a bath or right. a shower? And we couldn't figure it out. We knew we had a limited budget. Faith right. communities often have a limited budget. Um, and all of the shower, accessible shower stalls were really expensive. Yeah, if you put accessible in front of it, it doubles the price. It does. <laughs> so just by the word accessible. It's frustrating. Yes, it is very frustrating. And so we were going over and over it. We knew we couldn't move forward. We couldn't do it without having it accessible, but we couldn't figure out how to do it within the budget that we had. And finally, one of our youth, I think, uh, looked at us and said, we don't know why you're so worried about this. You could just <laughs> tile the whole thing and put the drain in the middle. We went, that's brilliant. And so the whole room basically became the shower. It was lovely. It worked out great. And it was less expensive than any other design that we had imagined. And so those kind of stories help me remember that even though it can seem daunting, if you've been doing something one way for a long time, it can seem daunting to make sure that the barriers are removed. It's possible. It's possible. And it's, it's one of those things that the more you talk about it and the more that you, you just live that life of, of including people, um, the more it sticks with you. I can remember um, a, another event at the church where we were setting up, it was around Halloween time, yeah. and I believe we were trying to welcome people in, and we had little um, haunted houses that we wanted people to be able to go through. And the youth were setting them up. And um, I said, well, this is just kind of a cardboard box that you go through. You go through, go in one side, and out the other and it had lights and different pictures and stuff. How come there's nothing, you know, people aren't crawling under or jumping over things? And they just looked at me and said, well, David, a person in a wheelchair wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> if they came to visit us, we want to make sure that we're, we're accessible. And, yeah. you know, sometimes even I don't think of it. Right. Um, even though I've lived my life in a wheelchair um, well, since I was born, um, it's, you know, the more you talk about it with people, the more it kind of rubs off on them. Yeah. And it's, it's not, it's also that we don't think in the broad categories that we sometimes need. I mean, my stepson has autism and he's in that group. And if you just saw him on the road, he looks able-bodied. He is in fact able-bodied. Um, if you don't hear him talk, you don't know that he's not neurotypical. 
Mm -hmm. And the older he's gotten, the more different, the more skills he's learned. I remember when his uh, dad first decided to bring him into a faith community. Uh, he was five, and for the first probably year, they would come and they would only be able to stay for one minute in, in church mm. because then my stepson would get so agitated that they would have to leave. And then pretty soon it was five minutes, and then it grew to 20 minutes. And then finally, after several years of this, it grew to he can sit and serve us. And now, you know, you get his invitations on the Sundays when he plays in worship. Right. I love uh, going to his concerts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it's an amazing progression. But think about the commitment that, you know, his dad had to have um, to get him included in church was a big investment on his dad's part. And mm -hmm. the church had to have. The church had to be okay with having a literally having a screaming child in in church right. for as long as he could be there um, the church had to be okay with the Sundays where one one Sunday they asked him to be an acolyte which means he was bringing in the fire to light the candles and you know he the preacher's hair was blonde the flame was yellow he kind of thought they might go together and he made an attempt to catch her hair on fire and that might happen some weeks, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not very predictable when you make your community hospitable to everybody. But there's joy in that too. Right. And to have a community that would be willing to learn mm -hmm. how to be inclusive is a great gift, I think. I think so too. Yeah. Welcoming and having to bend the rules a little. Sometimes. Having to bend the rules a little sometimes, <laughs> right. We, when we were, um, starting services in our area uh, in North Austin, I remember we suddenly realized that there was a community of persons that had hearing impairment and that mostly signed. And we decided that we wanted to be the kind of place where they could be welcome. Now we didn't have anybody at the time who was deaf and whose primary language was American Sign Language. We didn't have anybody. But we knew that those persons were in the community. Mm -hmm. And so we got together and we said, well, what would have to happen in order for that group to feel like it was okay to be here? And what we decided was we were going to need an interpreter. And so we prayed about that and we tried to figure out how to do that. And then we got an interpreter. And we had an interpreter for how many weeks before anybody who had a hearing impairment ever came. Right. It was a lot of weeks, right? But then they did. But then they did. They did come. Yeah. They, they felt welcomed and um, continued to go to church there. And so it's, it's thinking through not who's here, but who might be sent. Right. The old adage, build it and they will come, right? Right. <laughs> but sometimes we say, we have it, and if you can get in the door, you're welcome. Right. Right. Faith communities can do better than that. We can. Absolutely. Yeah. And if your faith community would like to do better as well, please join us in Austin for the symposium coming soon. For more information about the Austin Interfaith Inclusion Network, please visit our website, onestarfoundation.org, or call Suzanne Potts at 512-287-2043. This project is funded by a grant from the Texas Council for Developmental Disabilities.